He is a Dunlap Fellow at the Dunlap Institute for Astronomical Instrumentation. He, he uses infrared astronomy. You'll hear a lot about that tonight because it's the topic of his talk. In particular, Suresh did his PhD at one of the birthplaces of infrared astronomy. Uh, that's at the University of Arizona. So we really have an expert with us today. Uh, so instead of me telling you an intro about infrared astronomy, I'm going to let Suresh do it. Thank you. Well, thank you everyone for coming out on a cold night. Um, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in infrared astronomy. I've learned a little bit, and hopefully I can um, bring some of that interest, interesting joy and wonder associated with infrared astronomy to you guys tonight. And I kind of came up with a catchy title called Seeing Beyond Red with Cool Technology. How many people found that a weird title? <laughs> okay. Well, I, I will qualify that title. Seeing beyond red is basically infrared, so we're, we're looking beyond red. Hopefully that will come clear as I go through my talk. With cool technology, so there are two meanings to that actually. The, you know, the technology is pretty cool, but in fact it is really cool. And you, you'll see what I mean when I get there. So as I said, this talk is really about how infrared is changing astronomy. And here's a spectacular view of the center of our Milky Way that you can only see because you can look in the infrared. And, and I'll explain why. So the story of infrared actually begins with Sir William Herschel many years ago. Uh, how many of you know him? Okay, a few of you. Well, there's one more person here. He's actually quite extraordinary. He was uh, a composer as well as an astronomer. And he made extremely large telescopes in his backyard. And, and him and his sister worked very hard looking at the night sky. In fact, um, he discovered Uranus. And that's the correct, spe uh, correct pronunciation. But... Uh, he actually discovered something more important, and you can probably see where this is going. So he took a prism, so by that time people knew that sunlight was made up of different colors of light. Um, you know, Newton had figured that out by using a prism. And he did something a little bit different, so he took a prism, took sunlight, and, and let it get dispersed. So this is what you would see coming through that prism, you know, there's blue all the way to red. And that's, that's what we're familiar with. And then he did one other step. He actually put thermometers. So he took a little thermometer and put it at different parts of that spectrum. And so there's, there's energy in different parts of that spectrum. So if you put a thermometer there, the thermometer will absorb some of that energy and heat up. Obviously, when you do an experiment, you need a control, which means you, know, you want to put the thermometer somewhere else where there's no light. So you can put it over there, just past the red. But the strange thing was, um, if you put it just past the red part of the spectrum, the thermometer got really hot. So that was how infrared light was discovered. We can't see it, but it's there. And in fact, infra means below red, so that, that's where the name comes from. Now, uh, this is actually not uh, something new. We as human beings can actually sense infrared light. Anyone who's been at a campfire, um, been out in the hot sun, or yeah, you, you can actually feel, and some of you have probably used radiant heaters at home, you can actually feel that light. So we actually call it heat. So I just wanted to put things in context. Obviously, uh, you know, with the prism experiment, we know there are different colors of light, 
And those are the things that we can actually see with our eyes, and that's what we call the visible spectrum of light. But you probably have heard there are all these other things like gamma rays, x-rays, ultraviolet, radio waves, etc. They're all the same phenomenon, but the one different thing about them is um, they have different energy. So x-rays have very high energy, that's why you don't want to go get a chest x-ray very often. Um, gamma rays are even higher, they don't actually get through our atmosphere. Radio waves, we use it all the time with our cell phones. And so the actual visible spectrum is just a tiny little sliver in this whole electromagnetic spectrum. And one way of describing it is called wavelength. So the wavelength is related to you know, how, how far apart um, a wave of light, uh, a cycle of light is. It's just another way of representing different types of light. So there's visible light, and as I said before, infrared is just below red, so it falls um, to, the, to the right at lower energies. And the way we describe wavelengths of light is by a distance, and uh, in the infrared, we use the unit of measure called mic micrometers, so it's a millionth of a meter, or a micron, I might say in short. To give you a sense of scale, 100 microns is the width of a human hair. So we're talking about very, very small um, lengths here. So the infrared is actually a pretty broad region compared to what we can see in the visible. It goes from about, so it cuts off around 800, uh, uh, 8 tenths of a micron, and goes all the way up to 500 microns. And then you can actually break the infrared up into different regions. There's near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared. All right, so the second thing that's important is everything in this universe emits light. And that may not be a, a very common idea to have, and I'll, I'll prove it to you in a moment. Uh, this is, uh, so this is a, a representation of, of uh, an object, different objects at different temperatures. So how much light emits and what wavelength it emits light at is dependent by its temperature uh, for most cases. So if it's really hot, it will have different characteristic than when it's really cold. So what this thing is showing here is um, where the, that curve has the highest point is the peak of the curve, and that's where most of the light comes out at a given wavelength. So, so if something is, so that says 6,000 Kelvin, it's comparable to Celsius, so 6,000 Celsius, so it's very hot. Most of the light comes out in the visible part of the spectrum. So as the object gets cooler, that's what the lower ones are. So let's say at 3,000 Celsius or Kelvin, it's roughly the similar. Light comes out in the infrared, which is sort of uh, one, one micron. So as things get cooler, they shift. Where they emit light shifts more and more to the infrared. And here's a hot poker that I've shown. So here's very hot, so it, it's kind of a yellowish color and as it gets cooler, it gets redder, and at some point we can't see it anymore because it's emitting in the infrared. So here, here are some examples. Uh, 6,000 Celsius roughly is our sun. It's kind of a yellowish green color. And most of its light is coming out in the visible spectrum, and incidentally that's why our eyes are most sensitive there. A light bulb is about 1,000 Celsius, and some of its light, like these guys up here, comes out in the visible spectrum, but a lot of it, in fact most of it, comes out in the infrared. And that's why they're so energy inefficient. Hot coals, mostly in the infrared. There's a little bit of red in there, but most of the light comes out in the infrared. And I think you can all guess who this is. I'm not glowing, obviously, but I'm actually emitting in the infrared. Of course, um, one of the coldest things I know is liquid nitrogen. 
and it's that cold, it's almost minus 200 Celsius. Does anyone know what absolute zero is in Celsius? Someone shout it out. Okay, you guys have, have it memorized. So negative 273 is absolute zero. That's the coldest that you can possibly get in this universe. But liquid nitrogen isn't quite that cold. So it actually emits some light, if you, if you looked at it. Um, and its wavelengths are around 40 microns. So as things get colder, the light shifts further and further into infrared, and the wavelength shifts to longer, um, longer wavelengths. And our eyes can't see it, but they're actually emitting light. OK. Actually, there, there is one clear case of this that we live with every day, and you probably heard it constantly about global warming and so on. So there's the greenhouse effect. And f essentially, the sun is emitting light mostly in the visible part of the spectrum. And the Earth absorbs it and then re-emits it at, in the infrared. And some of that energy gets trapped by the atmosphere. And that's, that's essentially what the greenhouse effect actually is. So once again, the Earth itself is emitting energy. And if it weren't for this, our, the average surface temperature of the Earth would be about minus 20 Celsius, which is not particularly exciting, instead of 15 Celsius. All right, so I'll try to show you a demo, if I can get it working. So what I have with me here, I look at all of that, what is that? It's just like a mass of blobs. I see, I see the blobs waving their arms. <laughs> Let's do an experiment. Let's turn the lights off. Actually, it's this one here. No change. I think you get the point. So this is actually a handy gadget that you can buy for your smartphone. It's actually an infrared camera. So what you're seeing here is a false color image of the light that your body is emitting in the infrared. So this camera is sensitive to uh, around 10 microns. That's uh, basically around your body temperature. So it's very useful. So this is just brightness. It's not telling you the color. It's a false color image. So it, get, it gets you a representation of what the infrared light is. And it has a lot of uses in, in modern day world. You can, if you're a heating and AC uh, repairman, you can actually use this to see if all the heating ducts are working. Uh, if you're a homeowner, you can actually look at the walls and see if uh, there are leaks in, and if the insulation is bad. So it gives you a sense of how hot things are. So if I look at my hand here, you can actually see that. My hand's actually colder than some of you out here. It's actually a little bit fainter. Hmm? Oh, yeah, she knows. So here's a table. It looks, looks pretty boring, right? And if I actually heat up the table with my hand, so I'm not kidding when I say everything emits light. So let me get out of this here. Keep going. That's what I read when I'm bored. <laughs> OK, so now we're back to the same uh, spectrum plot that I showed you. So a lot of astronomy historically has been done in the visible part of the spectrum because you know, people started off looking through telescopes. You know, that's what your eyes could see. 
So there's been a lot of work done in that field. In the last uh, couple decades, different parts of the spectrum have been being filled in. And of course, my, my principal interest is the infrared, so that's what I'm going to talk about. So it's, it's really opened up a whole new discovery space in, in this area, and hopefully I will convince you of that. So you might ask, you know, what, what does infrared give me in terms of understanding the universe? Well, the universe is a very dusty place, and by astronomers, when we say dust, it's everything that's not a gas that's kind of floating out there in space, little grains of things out there in space. And not everything in the universe is hot like stars. So there are a lot of cool things like planets and so on. So for example, a lot of this dust is created when massive stars, they're at the end of their life, they actually generate a lot of um, different elements and then they condense out into dust grains. They deposit a lot of this into a galaxy. So uh, these are the kinds of things you can look in the infrared. Where stars are forming, they heat up the dust, and then they become very bright in the infrared. And also, turns out the dust is transparent in the infrared. So it does a bad thing in the, op uh, in the visible spectrum, it blocks stuff. But in the infrared, you can actually look through it. And of course, there are other things like planets and very cold things in the universe that you cannot see with your eyes. So here, here's sort of a... Uh, a scale of ma um, different things in, in the order of magnitude scale. So there is our sun again, and it's been cut off. It looks fine on my screen. The sun is 0.5 microns, so that's right in the par middle part of the visible spectrum. The smallest stars, which are M dwarfs, they're more like light bulbs. Most of the light comes out around one micron. And then you have brown dwarfs, these are the fail stars. They're even cooler. They're well, you know, about a thousand Celsius or cooler. They're at two microns. So you, these are things you can't see with your eyes. Jupiter, actually, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm actually not entirely accurate, but Jupiter, you can actually see with your eyes, and that's because there's the sun, that's, the light from the sun is reflecting off of it, but it, it has actually a lot of infrared radiation coming out of it. And it's around 150 Celsius, just a little bit over boiling water. And a lot of its energy comes out at 7 microns. And then we have our Earth, which, thanks to the greenhouse effect, is a uh, balmy 15 Celsius, 10 microns. And then there's that pesky dust I told you about in the galaxy that's in the far infrared, and it's around 100 microns. So you really need technologies to, new technologies to look at these different parts of the spectrum and understand what's going on. So actually the, one of the first discoveries, and actually Dr. Frank Lowe was at the University of Arizona many years ago and he was one of the pioneers of infrared astronomy and the reason he was able to um, make these steps in the infrared was he had built a new detector that was sensitive in the infrared and just had one pixel. Our cameras today have you know, millions of pixels. They had one pixel and they could point it anywhere in the sky. And anywhere on the sky they pointed, they found something and there was a paper. And one of the first papers, you might be surprised, was of Jupiter. So that's how Jupiter looks in the optical. That's what we're all familiar with. You know, I think that's a nice Hubble image. And that's an image taken in the infrared from a ground-based telescope looks very different. The dark parts of the, uh, the clouds look bright over there and the bright parts look dark. And in fact, the dark parts of the clouds are when you're looking deeper into the atmosphere where it's a bit hotter, so it looks brighter in the infrared because it's emitting more light. So the discovery was Jupiter was putting out more energy than it was receiving from the Sun. So uh, it was putting out a lot of the energy in the infrared. And that meant that Jupiter was slowly contracting. So that, that was a, a big discovery back then. I'm sure you have, you have quite familiar with this by now, which is uh, taking images of extrasolar planets. 
And that's uh, done in the infrared also. And there's a reason for that. So for example, uh, this is an image of a Sirius with its companion down there. And you can see that the, the, star is, the central star is extremely bright, while its companion in the lower left is quite faint. So this is the kind of problem you face when you're trying to find planets around stars. And planets, they're cooler, so they emit a lot, most of their energy in the infrared. So if you try and look at it in the visible spectrum, the star is generally a lot brighter than the planet. So you basically blot out the planet's signal. But if you went into the infrared, the star's not as bright as it would be here, and the planet would be brighter, so you get a better contrast. And uh, this was a pretty interesting discovery from a few years ago where they found, actually there are now four, I believe, planet around this particular star. And this was done in the infrared. I mean, there's, there are other reasons for this, but um, there's technologies like adaptive optics that help you improve the qual image quality of the system. That, may, that mainly works on the infrared, but I'm not going to talk about that today. All right, so I had mentioned about this dust. So how many of you have actually seen the, the center of the Milky Way or in the night sky? Okay, a handful of people. You guys have to go out of the city once in a while and look up. Actually, this, this probably take, uh, I, I believe this must have been taken in the southern hemisphere because we don't get as good of a view of the central part of the Milky Way. So what you see here is the Milky Way has a nice disk and then has a bulge in the center. And does anyone know what those pesky dark lanes are? Right, they're dust clouds. So they, they actually obscure your view into the Milky Way. And you know, we're sitting in the plane of the Milky Way and looking in, there are all these dust clouds and they block out the light of the stars behind them. So you can't actually see much of the Milky Way. So here's a little graphic. Essentially what the dust cloud does is it takes away uh, most of the visible light and actually lets some uh, the infrared light through. And the other thing the dust cloud likes to do is it, all the visible light it absorbs, it actually heats it up. And like I said, everything emits light. It heats up a little bit and starts emitting in the infrared. So depending on where you look, you can either look at the stars or you can look at the dust clouds. So this is actually a quite useful phenomenon that's actually used on the Earth. I believe this is a fire, I'm not sure exactly where, somewhere on Earth. And it's a satellite image of the fire. So if you look at the top half, that's what you would see if you used your eyes looking down from the satellite, basically smoke. But if you look in the infrared, slightly past the visible, the smoke is actually more transparent and you can actually look through. And firefighters actually use this, you know, when the house is on fire and they go in and they want to make sure that, you know, there's nobody in there, they actually use this kind of technology to see if they can see someone in there. So it's, it's actually very critical technology. So this is a picture looking somewhere close to the center of the Milky Way and you can, you can tell by the number of stars you see, there are lots of stars. And it's also kind of dark in the back. And this is taken in the visible light. And if I go to the infrared, the view is completely different. And if you don't believe me, just look at this star here. There it is. And you see thousands more stars. It looks better on my screen. I think this projector needs better contrast. I'm just trying to prove to you that in the infrared you can actually look. Uh, this is in the near infrared. You can actually look and see many more stars that are obscured by the dust clouds in front of them. And thanks to this, uh, this very interesting work was done. And these little blobs are all stars. Uh, so this is looking at the center of the Milky Way. We see that star there. 
uh, that's the center of the Milky Way and people looked at these stars I think something like 15 years or something tra tracing the orbits of these stars using the infrared and they found that they looped around the center object here uh, you can watch the, the closest star there as 0 2 I think and so it'll come down and it just whips around the center and this was used to point that um, to point out that there's actually a supermassive black hole at the center of a of our galaxy thanks to infrared images this is another familiar sight for many people who look up in the sky there's your favorite Orion in the visible and there's that kind of yellowish dot on the corner which is Betelgeuse everyone know Betelgeuse okay <laughs> movie or a star right <laughs> This is how it looks in the, in the mid-infrared. So in this case, we're actually moving further into the longer part of the infrared spectrum. So we're actually seeing the dust clouds emitting light. So you can see all these dust clouds. It turns out that there's a lot of star formation going on in, this, in, in, in Orion. And in fact, you can't see any of the other stars, right? Except for Betelgeuse. Betelgeuse is you know, having its death throes, it's uh, a red giant. And in that phase, they generally generate a lot of dust, and they're actually quite bright in the infrared. Here's one other example. This is actually some work that we did here. Here's a beautiful spiral galaxy. This is in, in the Virgo cluster. And this is a Hubble image just um, what you would see with your eye if you were on Hubble. If you're looking through Hubble, unfortunately, you can't do that. And if you add infrared, which you get from one of the space telescopes, you see this. So that's looking at the dust of this galaxy, and it's getting blown out in this direction. And that's because the galaxy is moving through the Virgo cluster, which has a lot of gas in it generates a wind which can actually blow the dust and gas out of the galaxy. And finally, another uh, this application is a very interesting one, especially now. I'm, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the expanding universe. The universe is accelerating. The expansion of the universe is accelerating. We had a Nobel laureate who discovered that come by a few weeks ago, I think. And what happens as the universe expands, so let's take uh, the first step up there, where you have a galaxy out in space and the Milky Way, and the galaxy emits some light. Let's say it's blue. 10 billion years ago. As time goes on, the galaxy moves away from us. The space in between us and the galaxy expands. So what it does is it actually stretches the light coming from that galaxy as it marches along trying to reach us. And when we get there, or when it gets to us, the light gets stretched quite a bit. So I talked to you about the wavelength of light, so that's, that's the metric uh, of distance used to express different energy of light. And the wavelength gets longer, so what started off as blue ends up looking red. In fact, a lot of the galaxies that we're interested in, they're far enough away that it that their light comes out in the infrared when it reaches us. So you can't see these things unless you have the infrared. So here, here are some galaxies that people found very far away, billions of light years away from us. On the left hand side you have images taken in different colors in the visible light. So as you go in this direction things get redder and this is uh, infrared images uh, at longer wavelengths. So in the visible you don't see them at all. And in the infrared they just pop up because the light that was being emitted in sort of in the visible part of the spectrum gets stretched and by the time it gets to us it's in the infrared. So there are a lot of surveys that are being done with infrared cameras to find these very distant galaxies. Alright, so that's all of the applications 
Now I'll shift gears into the cool technology part. So if inf infrared astronomy is so cool, why did it take so long? And there are several reasons for that, and I'll, I'll step through each one. The first, I sort of alluded to, is the technology to detect infrared light has taken a while to reach a point where it's getting as good as your digital camera, which looks in the op uh, visible. And they're still extremely expensive. So it needs a whole, whole different kind of technology. The second problem is actually the atmosphere. As I said before, everything emits light. The atmosphere around the Earth is at some temperature. It emits light in the infrared. So that's going to get in the way if you're trying to look at things out in space. And it also absorbs infrared radiation. So third thing, which is related to one I already said, is the background. Your instruments, the telescope, everything is at room temperature, everything is emitting infrared light. So that can completely drown out any faint signal you want to look at from the universe. So this obviously leads to very expensive hardware and cryogenics. So here's an example. This is an instrument I worked on. Yeah, it looks like a very messy lab. If there's an earthquake, I would have been crushed instantly. And it's still that way, actually. <laughs> I've since left. This was when I was at Arizona. So here's actually an instrument that I worked on. So that cylinder there is liquid nitrogen. 160 liters, cheaper than milk per liter. And the blue, big blue thing is actually the instrument, and inside is all the hardware, and all that stuff is kept at very cold temperatures, liquid nitrogen temperatures, minus 200 Celsius. So it's actually very complicated to build these things. And I'll show you a peek inside. So these things get bolted onto telescopes, and then we point the telescope at some interesting thing, get, get some data, analyze the data, write a paper, the end. <coughs> Boring life of a scientist. So that's how it looks on the inside. So this whole internal part is at minus 200 Celsius. And you need, you know, you, there are a lot of details you need to consider uh, things contract when they cool down, things behave differently when they get cold, and you have to consider all these things. This shiny thing here, how many of you have had those thermal blankets before? Okay, so you guys know. It's very similar to that. Um, it's just a thin sheet of mylar with some um, silver coating or aluminum coating and they have many layers of it and actually acts like an insulator. So whatever is cold on the inside will stay cold. Okay, so time for a demonstration just to show how hard things are. I'll probably need a volunteer. Uh, so many volunteers. How about you? Yes, you. Congratulations. <laughs> I got to such an accomplishment. I got to get this working first. Don't worry, I'm not going to make you take your clothes off or anything. I thought the technology did that. <laughs> Well, I'm going to show you, it actually does not. This does not take the clothes off of you. And in fact, I'm going to be the test subject, so don't worry. I actually went to Cuba this May, uh, and I was supposed to have a good time. They were supposed to have a beach party on the last night I was there. And I got there, and they made me take my clothes off. OK, I guess not that funny. <laughs> All right, uh, give me a sec. All 
There we go. Whew. Never, you can never rely on these things. Okay, here we are again. So you're going to just hold this and point it at me. So I'm going to stand over here. Oh, I guess it needs the magic touch. So let me try this again. Is it connected by Wi-Fi? Yeah, I have a Wi-Fi thing here. Come on. Just some technical difficulties. You'll get what you paid for. <laughs> All right. All right, I have the magic touch and I'm giving it to you. All right. Oh, okay. So that has to be me. So I have a glass plate here. Can everyone see me through the glass plate? Yes. Now I'm gonna put it in front of my face. Okay, it's not that exciting. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make is glass is actually opaque in the mid-infrared. So you can't actually see through it. And now there's this thing. So this is black. Can't see, th see through, right? No? Okay, now that was interesting. <laughs> not that interesting. <laughs> I'm not done yet. So this is polyethylene. It's actually uh, relatively infrared transparent and it's actually used as lens materials for infrared cameras. Now that's something, let's do something a little bit more interesting. Cheaper than milk. I should probably wear those cryo gloves, but whatever. Oh, look at that. So here's some liquid nitrogen here in a Super 8 cup. I don't know where that came from. So one thing you'll notice right away is there's not a lot of infrared emission coming out from liquid. Nitrogen. I mean, a lot of that emission has been shifted off into the, the mid to far infrared. And so, actually, let's uh, try it on here. So I'll pour a little bit on the table so if you can point the camera there. Uh, you can bring it closer. So if I pour a little bit. It just rescales. Hopefully, I don't wreck the table. <laughs> Pours like water. It has almost the same density as water. So it looks pretty cold. Now, I'm going to take this piece of card. It's hard to tell if it's too different. But if I put it here, it's pretty obvious that it stands out. We can bring it closer. It's already cooled off in the center, but um, basically by cooling this table, I'm reducing the infrared radiation coming from it so I can see something that's um, a little bit brighter in the infrared better. We're just trying to make a point that um, that's why we cool instruments down so we can look at, 
we can look at objects, um, infrared objects. I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not done yet. So now comes the fun part. So, no, yeah, your services are still required. Uh. I probably have to speed this up because I have a lot more to talk about. <laughs> so I poured more liquid nitrogen into this nice thermos flask. And you're going to do something that might make some people angry. You're going to ruin a perfectly good rose. So you stick it in there. Be careful. And stick it in a little bit more. And then wait for a while. You can take your hands out. Okay, now you can pull it out. And you can smash it on the table. Wow, <laughs> you, made, you made quite a mess. Uh, I'll clean it up later. <laughs> you can go back to your seat now. Well, that, there was a point to that. The point was, the reason the rose shattered is the, um, the petals hardened when you dipped it in the liquid nitrogen, it was much less flexible than it would be. And so when you gave it an impact, it shattered. So material properties change when things get cold. And when you build instruments that work in these regimes, you really have to think very hard to make sure things don't break and things work in the way that you expect. So now moving on to detectors, so in, the reason, one of the reasons infrared detectors have become quite popular is for defense reasons. There aren't a lot of spy satellites up in space. They're very good for heat-seeking missiles. And that picture on the left there is actually what we use for astronomy. We can actually buy these detectors from a company in the U.S. called Teledyne. And they'll charge you a pretty penny. I guess that's worth like half a house in Toronto right now. <laughs> It's, li it's literally this big. We have a couple of them in our lab we're using for our instrument. And this is state of the art, four megapixels. So your, your cameras are like 10, 20, 30, who knows what. So uh, we're now at four megapixels. And these detectors are gonna be flying in the next big space telescope, which I'll end with this talk. So it's really state of the art. And this is a little bit technical, but what these detectors do, these detectors fall in basically two different classes. One class is uh, the light comes in, a photon of light hits the detector material, and you have to pick different materials so that they're sensitive to infrared light. And it pops off an electron that you, you catch with your electronics, and then you can actually tell, actually sense the light. So one of the difficulties have been making these uh, materials in a very pure fashion so that they have they are very sensitive when you make these arrays. The other way to detect infrared light which our bodies can already do are called bolometers <clears throat> and essentially what a bolometer is is it's got a little target that is very absorbent to infrared light so when the infrared light hits it it warms up ever so slightly just like when you're sitting at a campfire, your, your skin warms up. And there's a very sensitive thermometer attached to it. And so by measuring the change in temperature, you can tell if you have sensed an infrared light, uh, in, infrared photon. And that's exactly how these things work, called microbolometer arrays. And uh, this camera costs about 300 bucks. iPhone sold separately. 
and there are other, there's another camera on the market that's 200 bucks. So it's, it used to be in the thousands of dollars, and it's finally coming down in price due to economics of scale and improvement in technological processes. This is a kind of array that we would use in astronomy. It's hypersensitive, and you can see it's quite complicated. Each one of these squares is a pixel, and they're 2,000 pixels. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And this array was on the Herschel satellite to detect um, the far infrared. So there were three things I mentioned, the third being the atmosphere. And it turns out that because there's the greenhouse effect, it means there are molecules in the atmosphere that absorb infrared radiation. That means that infrared radiation that's coming in from outside the Earth are also going to get, is also going to get absorbed. And so I've kind of drawn a plot here where 100% means it does not get through to the surface of the Earth, which is good because X-rays are bad and UV is bad thanks to the ozone layer. And then there's the colored region, which is what our eye can see. Most of it gets through. And then in the infrared, there are little windows. And then in the far infrared, you can't even see anything. It's all blocked out by the atmosphere. And then back in the radio, you can see again. So that is another challenge. We get w some windows in the infrared on the surface of the Earth, and if you want to see anything outside of those windows, you have to go to space. That's just how it is. So you have to build satellites and, and so on. And then, of course, the atmosphere emits light, and it's predominantly due to water vapor in the atmosphere. And so what we try to do is we try to go to high and dry locations where there's not much water, and also cold, like Antarctica. It's a perfect place for infrared astronomy. So here, here's some of my, f well, I haven't been to Chile yet, but um, there's Tucson, where I used to be, and there's Mauna Kea in Hawaii. That's another hub for astronomy, Keck telescopes, the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope in the foreground. So. Um, that's, that's one of the reasons we go up there. This is something that people here are working on. Blast pole, I think they're in Antarctica right now. It's a balloon-borne telescope that can look in the far infrared. So they have to actually launch it and it goes up in the high atmosphere to get above all of this stuff that absorbs light and emits light. This is my favorite. How many of you know of Sophia? Okay, just a few. It's some crazy American-German venture where they cut a hole in a 747 and put a telescope in it. It actually works. So here's, here's a picture of Jupiter taken. I mean, that's what everyone does, right? When you build your first infrared instrument, point at Jupiter. Uh, it's doing more than that. I'm, I'm not, I'm just trying to be facetious here. So once again, that's to try and get above the atmosphere, uh, a lot of the atmosphere beat down the background and get less absorption. And if you're really rich, you can turn it into a space telescope. So that's the last of the great observatories. So there were four great observatories. Spitzer was the last one. And so they launched it and it was f had a big tank of superfluid liquid helium. Liquid helium is much colder than liquid nitrogen and they needed it to cool their instruments in the telescope and you can see the temperatures are just insane. The instruments were a little bit over one Kelvin or one degree above absolute zero. And unfortunately, it's a non-renewable resource, so it boils off and then you're done. There's uh, t telescope warms up, your backgrounds go up, you can do a sense, uh, measurements, sensitive measurements in the infrared. Um, Spitzer is still out in space, is still doing science. The cryogenic mission has ended, but some of its instruments still work even though the system is warmed up. All right. Obviously, there was that big title picture from my talk, and that was the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's the next big thing. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it, um, especially if you're in the States. It is a humongous monstrosity of a telescope. And it's, I don't know, who, whoever's working on it probably doesn't get to sleep at night, just thinking about it. 
And so it literally looks like a big ship in space. And I'll give you a sense of scale in a bit. There's a very large Canadian involvement. Uh, one of the instruments, actually two instruments on the James Webb Telescope are from us. I'm Canadian, even though I was, I was in the US. And it, it, it looks in the infrared. So it goes from about one micron, a little bit into the optical. So there's a little bit of overlap with the Hubble Space Telescope. And then it goes to about 30 microns. And it has uh, three, uh, four major instruments, sorry. So here's, here's a sense of scale for you. So on the very far left is the Hubble Space Telescope. That's the, the primary mirror, the main um, mirror that collects light. And the Spitzer Telescope I showed you earlier, it's about yay big. And that's how big the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be. So it's very large. And that's just the mirrors. So this is an image of the mirrors in a testing chamber. So these mirrors are actually made of beryllium, which is a very lightweight metal. And it's very hard to machine and polish. So that's one of the challenges. Um, the reason you use beryllium uh, is partly because it's pretty light. Uh, it's good infrared um, material for infrared mirrors. And what they have to do is they have to first polish these mirrors to the figure that they think it should be, put it in this cryogenic vacuum test chamber, cool things down, and look at where the mirrors end up, the, the surfaces of the mirrors. And then send it back to the shop and take out the kinks and bring it back. So you got to do this a couple of times until you get the perfect finish on the mirror. So it's very time consumed, hence the expense. Uh, here are the instruments that top left corner is the Canadian instrument. And then there, there are three other instruments uh, MIRI is a European US combination. Near spec is a mainly European mission uh, instrument. So all these instruments get integrated on the back of the telescope. And, and of course, I think this is what keeps people up at night, is the sun shield. So before I said Spitzer had a whole bunch of liquid helium to keep it cold. Well, JWST is really big, and you can't carry so much liquid helium or any sort of cryogen with you. So they've come up with a clever way of using that thermal blanket material I told you about, several layers of it, and make sure that the telescope, the, the, the shield is pointed at the sun and shadows the telescope. Turns out that you can actually get the telescope pretty cold that way, because it's looking out at space, which is quite cold. And obviously the shield, um, you'll see that the shield would have to unravel properly in order for it to work. We don't have anything big enough to fit the entire telescope the way it is fully extended. So it has to be all folded up in the nacelle of this rocket and then unravel itself when it gets out to space. And it's going to be uh, stationed at L2, which is about three times as far from the Earth, uh, sorry, uh, three times as far from the Earth moon distance. And it's not going to be serviceable, so it has to work when it gets there. Just to quickly wrap up, what kind of science can JWST do? Well, one of the most interesting things it can do is uh, try to take spectra of planets, of extrasolar planets, and look for biosignatures, for potential possibility of life on these planets. And the second thing it can do really well is look very far back in time and see the first galaxies that ever formed. So 13 billion years ago, it will be able to see those galaxies. So all this effort to look at that. As I said before, the galaxy's light gets redshifted. So the further away it is, the redder its light. So you really need something like JWST to see these things. And I thought I'll end with this. Uh, you guys can watch. It's Transformers. It's a video of JWST actually when it reaches, as it's on its way to L2, it has to do all this stuff 
in order for it to work at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Suresh. That was a very fun and exciting talk, full of magic tricks. But it was it's not, it's not magic. But it was science. Uh, <laughs> as exciting as magic tricks, I should say. Um, so uh, we probably can take about two questions. And then if you have further questions, you can ask the rest afterwards or any of us astronomers walking around for the rest of the tour. Two questions. Who's going to ask them? What? Uh, when was the telescope going to be launched? Oh, I, I forgot to mention, uh, it should be on in 2018. Oh. So about four years from now. Yeah, a little less than four years from now. So they've made a lot of progress. Maybe three questions, and so one more after after you. Uh, how many pencils is James Webb, and how much will it cost, and can it only be a captain of red? Okay, that's like three questions, so I'll try to answer. So the first uh, question was how many pixels in the James Webb? Uh, there are three different instruments. I'll talk about the one instrument that has a lot of pixels. That's uh, NearCam. A uh, NearCam is just a camera that works in the near-infrared. It has four of those four megapixel detectors, so 16 megapixels. Second question was how much does it cost? About eight billion dollars. Yeah. There was, there was a lot of controversy a couple of years ago when their budget ballooned from five to eight and they were threatened, the US Congress was threatening to shut it down. I don't know what your third question was. Oh, if it was only in the infrared. Uh, it's predominantly in the infrared, but it can see a little bit of the optical. But yeah, there's a little bit of overlap with the Hubble Space Telescope. This and, one. Yep. How are the barium mirrors polished? That would intrigue you some of that. Oh, okay. I'm not an expert on that. Um, there's a company it's called Tinsley, I believe. They have some special polishing techniques. They first lightweight the mirrors. They carve out the back sides of the mirrors uh, to reduce the weight, and then they, they have some polishing technique. I'm not exactly. Would diamond dust be one of your guesses? I don't know. I'm sorry, I, I, can, I can look that up and get back to you. <laughs> Great, thank you again, Suresh.